everyone, welcome and thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar. It's my pleasure to be joined by Alex Gaynor from the University of Alberta. Alex has prepared a really interesting overview and explanation on the importance of peer learning and we'll be sharing three different techniques for easily implementing peer learning in any course and really how to use these activities to further drive engagement, understanding and curiosity in a course of varying sizes. So in today's webinar, Alex is going to share what peer learning is, why it's important, and how instructors can implement peer learning uh, through online discussion, through think pair share activities, and through two exams, which I did not know about until I started working with Alex. Uh, we'll then take questions at the end of the presentation and open up a dialogue with everyone to share some clarity. And now I'll turn over to Alex. Great. Thanks a lot for the introduction, Alex. Uh, my name is Alex Gaynor. I'm an instructor at the University of Alberta um, in the economics department. I teach largely uh, the big introductory courses, so that ranges in size from 75 to 400, but it's a lot of three or 400 uh, enrollment classrooms. So I want to start off with kind of a story. Uh, I did a practice run through of this webinar a couple days ago with the Packpack folks. And during that uh, practice run, I asked them, I, was, I told them I was insecure about my background. I'm doing this webinar in my campus office and it's my two and four year olds uh, craft projects that I just kind of hastily taped to my wall. <laughs> and I was kind of joking with the Pack Pack folks that I do this because to kind of remind myself I'm a human, that I have a life outside the classroom. But uh, the real reason I do it is I know office hours or coming to your instructor's office, especially when the instructor teaches a large course, it can be kind of intimidating and awkward. So I put these up here to try to make my office hours less scary and show students I don't take myself that seriously. So I kind of want to bring this up because I think that's a lot of what peer learning does. Uh, it helps lower anxiety in the classroom, change attitude and relationship about the course. We'll start off by looking at peer learning. Oh, sorry. I'll figure this out. <laughs> so peer learning, it's been around for a while, uh, and it can refer to a lot of things, but basically means trying to get your students to collaborate more often, work with each other uh, more often. And for me, in my classroom, it looks like students discussing issues with each other, debating issues, and what I really like to see is them teaching each other and learning from each other. And in general, uh, I think it really results in a more active learning experience. I've been using peer learning for the last couple of years, but I've been interested in creating an active learning environment for quite a while, so it really goes hand in hand. Peer learning really helps you um, make your classroom even more engaging, more active. And I kind of want to share a cool analogy I thought about peer learning. So I went to a talk a couple of years ago about uh, active learning and instructors saying how if when someone hires a personal trainer to get in better shape, a uh, personal trainer might show them, you know, explain a push up, what a push up does, uh, do a few push ups in front of them, and then the person would have to actually do the push ups to get in better shape. So his analogy was the old traditional chalk and talk lectures where we stand at the front. Uh, it's like us doing the push-ups for our, our students. So we're standing at the front, we explain the concept, but then they don't actually work through that concept or discuss it or get their hands messy through it. We'll just show them an example and then work through the solution. Uh, so I think active learning, peer learning, really leads to richer learning experience uh, and better learning outcomes. So I love this quote a lot. I was trying to figure out who said it and like a lot of things on the internet, there's a fierce debate about it. A lot of people believe it's Einstein, a lot don't. I like Einstein and it's my presentation, so I'll say Einstein came up with it. But I really think uh, being able to teach a concept to someone else is a really valuable learning experience and it's a true on whether or not you've actually learned something. The first time I taught a course, a colleague asked me at the end of the semester, and this was a first year course, introductory course, the material was relatively easy. 
he kind of asked me, did you have to relearn some things? Did you have to read up on the textbook? And I started laughing. I said, I had to relearn everything. Or I kind of said, I teaching this course, I realized I didn't actually know anything. Uh, and I can't believe two good universities gave me an undergraduate degree and a graduate degree in economics, when now I realize I don't know anything about economics, not even at the first year level. Uh, so I've kind of, that was my very first course, but it's really stuck with me throughout my teaching career. This belief that uh, until you can teach something, explain it simply to someone else, you don't really know it. And just the process of teaching something to someone is really a valuable learning experience in itself. So I've been a big fan. I've had a great experience with peer learning because I love seeing my students explain concepts to each other. And there's a lot of research out there saying that our students learn better when the concept is taught to them by a peer. Uh, we are kind of masters. We learned this a while ago and have mastered the subject. So it can be tough for us to teach it in a concept in a way that our students may understand. Uh, the light bulb can kind of go on for students. It can kind of, the concept can click when it's explained to them by a student. And that's one thing I've seen a lot on my course evaluations, course surveys, as students saying, uh, really helped you create these opportunities for us to learn something from our peers, because that's actually when something finally made sense. And also, research has found this, and I believe it as well, as peer learning really helps students develop soft skills that they can use later in life, when they get out into the real world and are working a career. Them having to debate or discuss with people, provide constructive feedback, explain something to people. It's a very good life skill, a soft skill uh, that is kind of lacking in the traditional lecture. So first kind of talk about the challenges, uh, but I'll point out kind of the obvious. I don't think, or the obvious to me, our students aren't doing that great in the traditional chalk and talk lecture where the instructor stands at the front and just lectures for the whole class. Uh, you could argue that's never really worked well, but I think it is really incompatible with today's students. They have, the you know, a lot of people believe they have, uh, can't keep their attention for longer. And like most instructors will tell you, there used to be in the classroom. Almost all of our students have a smartphone, so they got access to social media, Netflix, or whatever streaming platform they want, video games. So as an instructor, we're facing a lot more distractions, which is one that's being, you know, it's probably obvious to a lot of you and one that's being talked a lot. I kind of want to highlight a second one though. Um, technology, smartphones kind of prevent students from interacting with their peers as well. So before I would teach a lecture, I would be at the front of the classroom getting ready and a lot of my students would be talking to their neighbors, making small talk about the weather or something with their neighbors. Nowadays, when I'm at the front preparing, um, most of them are just on their phones, looking at their phones. They're not really talking to their peers. So I think that's another, that's something we don't really discuss enough. Um, and that's, I don't think, I think it's detrimental to the learning experience, just like them watching, you know, being on Facebook or watching Netflix during a lecture, them not interacting with their peers before, after, during class is also detrimental to the learning process. And I love learning, peer learning, because it kind of combats both of these. It makes a more engaging classroom, so it combats the distractions, and it's also providing a lot of opportunities and an environment that encourages face-to-face -face interactions with your peers. Very proud of this slide title that I came up with. Um, I feel like a lot of my peers, my colleagues, you know, it is very depressing when you start to think about, you know, how easy it is for students to watch Netflix or uh, be on Facebook or whatever social media they are in a classroom. But I guess one, that's the new reality. So we shouldn't spend too much time dwelling on it. And also acknowledging that there's a lot of advantages to technology. The fact that our students have smartphones with them all the time, uh, we can leverage that. We can use it to make the classroom more engaging, more interactive. So I'm kind of making the point today that peer learning isn't just an effective outcome, effective learning strategy, 
but it's very much, it's very effective with today's students and it's maybe more needed than ever uh, given our current students and given that they have smartphones. So key thing is students, they can't feel like they're being forced to work with their peers. Uh, it should be kind of fun and light and it should be more about the instructor creating an environment where they want to meet someone in their class and debate or discuss with them. And that can be tricky. Uh, the devil's in the details. Uh, I can't really go, well, I will go into it a bit, but there's a really good webinar I saw on Packpack a while ago, just talking about the advantages of the Packpack online discussion over, uh, you know, your normal LMS, Blackboard or Moodle discussion. Why all the little subtle things, not just Packpack has, gives you a much better outcome than you get with your kind of plain online discussion that you get kind of prepackaged. So I think peer learning and the three resources I'm gonna to discuss today, they're effective with generation Z or Z, depending on if you're listening in Canada or the US. Uh, Right now, it's really effective with them for two reasons. Um, the online discussions that PackPack provides, students really like it because it's natural. It kind of flows, it feels like Twitter or Facebook, or it's a medium that students are really comfortable with. Um, it's an assignment that they com they're comfortable with and they enjoy. And the second one is our students struggle to meet people in their classes. I believe that's that's always been true, but I believe that's more true today than it has been in the past. So peer learning also combats that. It helps them meet people in their class face-to-face. Uh, -face. So three ways, three main ways I encourage peer learning is I use uh, weekly online discussions through the PackPack website. I use what's called think pair share activities and two-stage exams. I, uh, I'll talk about today is the online discussions, which I use through the lovely platform Packback, obviously. <laughs> so the way I use Packback, great thing about Packback, it's very flexible. Um, people use it uh, in a lot of different ways. The way I use it is students have to ask, every week students have to ask one question related to that week's material and provide two responses to questions their peers asked. So this is kind of, how I run Packback, uh, the online discussions. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, it's flipping. One reason Packback appealed to me is it's really a different way, a different type of assignment. It's almost always, well, in the past, it's just been instructor providing question. Students have to provide a response, but it's very interesting. I like the idea of them having come up with uh, so one, I think it's a really effective assignment because it's kind of, it's involving higher levels of learning. So if you're thinking about this with Bloom's taxonomy, it's involving higher levels of cognition, like evaluation and application, things like that. So on its own, it's a very effective assignment because it's requiring higher cognitive abilities, um, things like that. Another, you know, great thing, and maybe more important is it's just before I discuss something in class, they're having to think about the material uh, and come up with a question and it's making them more curious. So I think I can't understate that enough. Student, my students are showing up to class more curious than there would be otherwise. Them thinking about a question and also them having to answer questions. So a lot of times it's them teaching a peer uh, concept, which, is a really valuable one. It might that might be the moment where the concept clicks for the two student, and two, the other student trying to teach is really, you know, having to think about the concept. How do I sum it up? How do I communicate it? It's kind of win-win for both students. The student teaching it, uh, the student learning it. So Packback works really well. It's got an algorithm that moderates it, makes sure the questions answers are appropriate. Uh, and uh, at least a minimum quality. And I also use TAs. You don't have to, but I use uh, some TAs to also moderate to make sure the questions are appropriate and maybe to make sure students aren't giving. It's rare, it, it was actually really rare I saw students 
providing the wrong answer, teaching concept in an incorrect manner, but you have TAs or there to, to uh, catch that as well. So another great thing about Packpack is uh, students, they have the option of putting a source in there. I was, it wasn't required for my class, but about 60% of students in my class provided a uh, source, which was kind of a happy surprise. So they really had fun with this. It wasn't, you know, I, I didn't really know what it would look like, but with a lot of posts there providing YouTube videos or news articles or a lot of memes, which is really funny and actually um, surprisingly relevant to the material. Uh, so it's cool. They, they had a lot of fun with it, uh, providing memes and funny things, and it made it easy for me to come up with my lectures. Uh, if you're an instructor, you know it can be really tough to, when you're teaching a concept, come up with an example that is interesting to students and relevant to students. But my students were providing examples from movies or TV shows or memes or news articles. So I didn't really, they were kind of doing all the work uh, for me. So it made the lectures easier to prepare, to, um, prepare for. The examples I used were more relevant, more interesting for my students. And a really big thing I found using Packpack is I would read the Packpack discussions before class and just reading those discussions got me really excited to teach that lecture. Uh, I thought, wow, like they actually care about this. They're actually interested in this. It got me really excited, which can be huge in the middle of the semester when you're drowning under grading and emails and things like this. And it also just, I could visibly see that my students care. They're putting in effort to the course, uh, which also kind of really motivated me to put more work into lecture, I guess, and uh, got me excited for the lecture. So now look at the second resource. So the first one, the Pack Pack discussions, they did outside of class. They did this, uh, they could do it whenever they wanted during that week, uh, as long as they had the internet connection. So think pair share activities. Um, in general, it's a think pair share activity is anything where it's a, a student's answer a question, uh, and then they have to get together with another student or a group of students to look at that question again, and they share their results with the class. So there's a lot of, I think this has been used for a while in K to 12 teaching. Uh, but it's become popular lately in higher education, college, university with the student response system. So it's really easy to implement with the student response system. You can just implement it on the fly. So before I lecture, I never know if I'm using a think pair share activity that day. So during my classes, every 10, 15 minutes, I put up a multiple choice question through a student response system, something like Top Hat or Reef or uh, Poll Every or whatever you use. So I put up a uh, a multiple choice question. And then students answer it on their own and then I put up the distribution, but I don't tell them the correct answer. So I have an example in this slide there. Uh, you can see it's A, B, C, D. So you can see about 40% of them picked B, but a lot of them picked A as well. And then quite a few people picked C or D. So in this class, I looked at that slide and said, huh, that's an interesting distribution. How about you guys try this again, but this time we'll work with your neighbors. So this, that's essentially all there is to think best share activities. And with any student response system, you just hit kind of restart or unpause it or whatever it is, and it'll keep going. Students can keep their existing response or they can change response. So it's really easy to implement. And again, I was really surprised how effective it was. Whenever I do this, there's always smiles, sometimes even laughter. In general, I encourage my students to work together, but they really work together more that second time when I say, because I'm giving them a clue, so it's kind of saying, most of you picked the wrong answer. Uh, so it's kind of a hint, and like, here's a chance. I haven't graded it yet. Here's a second chance to get it right. And, you know, work with your neighbors. Meet your neighbor, discuss it, debate it, things like that. See if you guys can work it out. Uh, but it's been really fun and easy to implement. So a lot of this depends on, you know, how comfortable students are talking to their neighbors. So it can maybe be an uphill battle at the start of the course, uh, but it gets easier. And I found after 
the first group exam I had, which I'll talk about in a minute here, it got way easier. After that first group exam, all of a sudden they knew most of their neighbors. So this think pair share activity worked much better after the first group exam. As the semester went on, they naturally met more and more of their classmates and it just got better and better. Uh, but it's a really easy, great way to implement peer learning. So two stage exams and excuse me for a second, I'll just grab some water. So two stage exams is kind of a weird name, but two stage exams, it's taking an exam. For me, it was my midterms and you have stage one. So that's students going and writing the exam individually. So that's kind of the traditional approach. Like we've been doing exams for all, all of time. So students go write the exam individually. Uh, then a few days later, they come back and do the same exam or a very similar exam, but they work as a group. So they come back and work as a group. It's kind of a second chance to go over the exam, review the exam, uh, and have another attempt at the exam. So one key feature with that's recommended with two-stage exams and that I used is you use what's called do no harm uh, grading for the group exam. So you tell your students uh, in the very unlikely event that you get a lower grade on the group exam than your individual exam, I'll give you the score in your indiv individual exams. So students, they can't mess this up. If they bomb their group exam, it doesn't matter. Uh, the higher score from their individual exam will be taken. So I can't, uh, I really wish I had a video, took a video of one of my group exams because the atmosphere, it could be more opposite of a traditional uh, individual exams. It's extremely loud. Uh, students are, I had, I've done this with a class of 75. I haven't tried it with a class of three or four, but I imagine it's gonna be really loud and chaotic there. But the other big thing, it's much lower anxiety. Uh, normal exam students are very anxious. They're very afraid to make mistakes. This one, you don't really see that at all. There's a lot of smiles, a lot of laughter. Uh, yeah, it's a really fun experience. And it's just them, you know, a lot of our students don't often even take the time to review exams, but it's them reviewing the exam, take another chance at it, having, they like it, it's a chance to raise their grade um, and I couldn't believe how act, how serious they took it. The exams weren't worth much. Each group exam is worth about 5% of their overall grade in my course. I'll probably make it lower next time, but I couldn't believe just that little amount of grading really motivated people to uh, work hard to get a better grade. Especially, um, I was really surprised with my I guess less academic students, students that often don't show up to class or aren't that interested in learning. And there's one uh, moment I can think of in my last group exam, it was guys that always sit at the back of the room when they do show up, uh, they're varsity football players, they don't take that seriously. But these guys were just going crazy on the group exam. They were debating it, they're just, and it was so natural to them, but it was just, Buddy, buddy, it's B, it's B, I swear. Like, Eric demand shifts left. He's like, no, 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 it's a movement along the curve. It's C, you got to do this. They were really debating it in a very positive kind of learning environment way. And then he said, ah, no, shoot, you're right. It is C, ah, damn, that makes me mad. But like, you're right, sweet, we got this one mark. Let's move on. And students were getting up, standing in aisles or standing at the front of the tables. They could work with one group, change groups. It's really chaotic, but uh, really great uh, atmosphere. I'm definitely gonna try it again. And like I said, it's really effective at helping students meet classmates. I had a lot of emails before the first one saying, I'm worried about the group exam. I don't know anyone in the class. I'm bad at meeting people. Uh, but after that, the second group exam in general, I could see when people came to class, they had friends. They're less likely to be on their phones or actually talking to their classmates beforehand. And even after, First group exam, I couldn't believe how many people are standing up, shaking each other's hands saying, hey, that was fun. Like my name's so-and-so, what's your name? And so that was one great, uh, another great advantage with two-stage exams. So those are my three resources. A few big takeaways now I've gone over the three resources. Uh, 
they all really complement each other. Packpack is kind of the first thing they do. They get used to working with each other, debating things, teaching each other things. And then you layer on the think pair share activity, which is similar, but it's in class. And then you add later in the term, the two stage exam. So the second stage is a group exam. So they all work really well together, complement each other, this idea of working with your peers, debating things, teaching each other uh, things. And it really creates uh, a more active, engaging lecture, which really promotes deeper learning. Like I kind of said, uh, I think when they have to post questions or responses on Packback, when they have to teach or explain something to appear in a think pair share activity or a group exam, they're using those higher cognitive abilities as explained by Bloom's taxonomy. So I kind of want to say this again, I worry I maybe overwhelm people. I've presented a lot and people think that sounds great, but it's going to take forever to implement, but it really doesn't take that much time to implement. Uh, Packpack has great support team. That's really easy to implement. If you use a student response system, there's really nothing involved with the think pair share. It's just, I guess, writing a note, remind yourself. If you get a split distribution, uh, cue this. And the group exams, uh, they're a bit more work. It's another exam, but if you use just Scantron multiple choices or you do it, uh, I did it, students brought their own laptop to do it, it's really easy to implement as well because you're not writing a new exam, it's the same exam and there's no grading if you're using Scantron or uh, they're doing it on their laptop. So when we talk about new technologies or resources, a lot of times people, we kind of discuss, you know, learning outcomes. So did the class average go up? Did participation go up? Um, we're really looking at kind of mechanical outcomes like this. So to start off with, I am very confident my class averages did go up. Participation did go up. When I look at my student response system at the end of the semester, I had higher attendance, higher participation. Uh, across everything. So I am really confident those things did happen and that my students were learning the material better. But I really want to emphasize the benefit here is the atmosphere it created uh, and the change in my students' attitude. I couldn't believe, especially as the semester progressed, how students were showing up happier. <laughs> There's less anxiety uh, about learning um, the exams. They're attempting, they're attempt looking at a lot of problems, think pair share activities and group exams with less anxiety, which I think is where the breakthrough happened. And a lot of students said they didn't understand something until the group exam, until they looked at it a second time and could, you know, ha have a peer explain it or, or debate it with a peer. And I really think that's powerful. We kind of know that people learn best when they're not afraid to make mistakes and if they're intrinsically motivated, if they're curious or interested about something. I think that's uh, one of the biggest benefits with peer learning is it makes lowers anxiety, makes our students less afraid to make mistakes, and just they changes their perspective. Uh, how, building curiosity or interest in the subject before you teach it or challenge them can really help them through that. So my one bone to pick is we we're kind of often guilty of focusing on you know. The, these certain learning goals were they met, but we also just focus on our students. Uh, we don't talk about ourselves, teachers. I think it's really important before you adopt a new strategy or resource, including the three uh, that I present today, you as an instructor ask yourself, is this gonna make my job funner? Is this gonna make my job easier? If the answer is no to those, then don't bother adopting it. It's not gonna work out, it's not gonna be good. Uh, sometimes we really have to stop and be selfish, think, is this going to make my class more rewarding? Is it going to lower anxiety or lower workload? Uh, because if it's not doing those things, I really don't think it's going to work out. I kind of go back to the idea of pack pack, just me. It's a lot of, and I'm sure other instructors can relate to this, weeks in the middle of the semester where you're tired, you're stressed, uh, you're thinking about, man, why am I going to this class when they're show up there to lecture and it's just gonna be blank faces. They don't wanna be there, uh, I'm tired, I don't really wanna be there. But just before every class going through Pack Pack really motivates me, gets me excited thinking, wow, like some of them already get it and have funny, interesting anecdotes or examples. 
about the subject. Uh, and also just, wow, they're putting in effort. They're really putting in effort. So I should put in effort as well. And just like with students, I think we underestimate how important a happy instructor is. If I'm happy, if I'm excited, if I'm, if I like my students more, the relationships improved. And if I'm in a better mood, my lectures are going to be better. I don't need any fancy statistical regression to show that. I think really believe um, it's subtle, but it's really powerful. Uh, happy instructor, be a better, we'll have better lectures, better office hours. It'll just be an overall better course. So big takeaway, peer learning is very, it does a great job at helping students learn material better. Uh, you'll see better uh, results on your exams, but the big benefit is students' attitudes and instructor attitudes. You're going to be happier. Both of you are looking forward to the lectures more, uh, and that's kind of where a lot of the benefits come from. So sorry, I went a little over time, but if we have some time for questions. I'll pass off to Anne. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, everyone, for, for sticking with us. But uh, and thank you, Alex. It's really amazing to see how you've used these techniques to build really active peer interaction in classes, even with 75 students. Getting a student to turn to the person next to them and say anything is a very intense battle. But at this time, we're going to take any questions that came in from the audience. And if you have something that you would like to ask Alex really specifically on, you know, please use the question mark icon at the top of your screen to submit. And we will be sending a recap video of this webinar as well if you want to reflect on it. But let's hop into some of the questions. Awesome. So um, have you seen your students become better critical thinkers? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think um, with these, yeah, with peer learning, I think they have become better critical thinkers. And it's really obvious in the pack pack, the online discussions. Uh, that's where you really see they're better critical thinkers. Uh, the, by the questions they come up with, especially it's big in economics, but if you can teach a concept to a student, uh, like elasticity, and they can apply it to in a novel way to a brand new situation, explain that situation, that's kind of like the holy grail. Uh, but you know, how, how do we know if that's happening with multiple choice questions, multiple choice tests? Pack back, you can see that there, that's kind of the assignment, a lot of the assignments, them saying, uh, here's a cool example. You know, what is a student asks, what, how does this make sense? Or what does, what's an example of this? And students can re reply. And I couldn't believe how often they were correct and how creative and interesting they were. But I think that's a great example. They're better critical thinkers because they can explain concepts to their peers. And I can see uh, this taking place and the application. I'm, they're taking something I learned in the class and applying it. And that, for instructors, is one of the most rewarding things, uh, seeing that light bulb go off for them, seeing the concept click. Awesome. Thanks for the question. Yeah, so uh, next question. How are the groups decided for your two-stage exams? Yeah, really good question. So there's kind of two schools of thought on this. So some people will assign the groups. So before the exam, they'll tell their students, uh, "Your this is your group. And there's a lot to be said for that. Uh, there's a lot of research. Uh, they try to make sure group is, you know, a strong student, an average student, a, a weaker student, or mix groups by genders or by other characteristics to make sure it's a healthy mix. Uh, so that's one school thought, which I think I'll try. I just kind of, it was <laughs> more chaotic, not structured approach. It's just show up, sit with whoever you want. Groups can be two, it can be 10. Uh, if you want to switch, halfway through exam, that's fine. So mine is a bit unstructured, so it's easier to implement. Maybe it's a reflection of me being lazy, uh, but it's easier to implement. And it worked out great, but I'm very curious about the other one where you assign groups. But for me, the larger classes, I, it's difficult or impossible to do assigned groups in big classes, so uh, that's tough. But I think there's a lot to be said for both. I, but research has shown both ways work, uh, assigned groups and unassigned groups. Good question. Awesome. Yeah, from uh, from Dean Olson, do you have a way to measure improvement in critical thinking? Many edu educators are finding that compelling. So, is, is how do we measure that change? Yeah, it's a good question. 
Yeah, to take to actually take it um, a, a little bit. Just We're kinda, working on that anecdotally, support. like it's. I guess it's uh, on surveys uh, on the anonymous survey response. A lot of students were saying, uh, "I really enjoyed." I was surprised at how me being forced to think up a question made me learn material at a deeper level. So I think just forcing them to come up with a question each week for a different topic uh, improved critical thinking. And it was just me reading the discussion board saying, wow, the answers, the questions they're coming up with really show that they understand the material and shows that they're being forced to use higher levels of cognition uh, to do that. I mean, Packback has curiosity points, their algorithm assigns curiosity points, which does a really good job. So I guess that's maybe a quick answer is you could use Packback's curiosity points to measure students' critical thinking, but it's really a question answer for it, I guess. I wish yeah. I did though. I'd be curious to hear if someone has any ideas. Um, maybe we can think of ways to objectively measure critical thinking performance also from, from Dean. So figuring out better ways to um, derive an objective metric for it, which is actually something that Backpack is working on, finding ways to better track the levels of critical thinking, how they're changing and improving so that it's not um, just left up to the individual instructor to make that more anecdotal assessment, being able to put a line in the sand and say, this is where the critical thinking has changed. So uh, we are working yeah. on that, but open to all ideas from other instructors in the ways that you personally are identifying critical thinking is shifting in my classroom. Yeah, I, I wish I had answered that. And like I said, the QS points do a great job of evaluating quality, but I mean, I guess, if, if Dean, if your instructor just, if you just try some of these methods, it's going to be obvious from the class response, from how your students' attitudes change, how they do, how they answer questions on the exams. You'll, you'll see, you know, not precise, you can't measure precisely how much critical thinking has gone up, but, you know, just trying it, you'll see clearly critical thinking's improved. Uh, and could you repeat the way that you uh, that you post questions in the think pair share activity and what tech do you use? Yeah, definitely. Uh, can I go back in slides or is that if if it's a lot of trouble, we, I don't know. Yeah, no. I don't think we can go back, but yeah, just kind of quickly recap it. So it's just like, I don't know, ask a question with my student response system. I've used Top Hat or my university's one or Reef or pull everywhere. So whatever student response system. So I ask a multiple choice question. So it might be what color is the sky? And you put yellow, blue, red. Uh, so if most of the students, and then you put up the distribution. So you see 10% picked uh, yellow, but the rest 45% picked blue, 45% picked red. So whenever you get interesting distributions like this where, and when I say interesting, interesting distribution, I mean, if students, most students didn't get the right answer or if, Maybe they did get the right answer, but they're fairly split on it. Uh, I just say, huh, that's interesting that about half of you picked B, half of you picked C. Let's try this again, but this time work with your peers. So the first time they did it more individually, although they're allowed to work with peers, but this time I really say, okay, do it again. I'm kind of saying most of you had it wrong. Uh, kind of, it's a hint most of you had it wrong or you know, at least half of you had it wrong clearly. Work with your peers. And usually whenever I do this, there's smiles and then they turn around and try to find someone. The first time you do it, it's, uh, and with this, they hang in there because the first time you do this, maybe not many students uh, are into it because they're a bit nervous. They don't know anyone. They know a few people in the class, but just hang in there as the more and more you do this, uh, the better it gets because they'll just slowly meet more people in the class. And especially after that first group exam, then they'll really know uh, quite a few people at least the neighbors and the area of the class they sit, uh, and it, it's really effective. Fun way, fun, engaging activity to do in the class. Awesome. And have you seen the classroom change since implementing peer learning? Yeah, it's a great question, Eric. Uh, yeah, I mean, I could talk about the metrics, the class average going up or participation on homework going up, but it's just walking, I don't know, I can't, put my finger on it, but it's just the atmosphere. Students are happier. Uh, there's less anxiety. There's more smiles, more laughs. 
And the student response is just a lot of my student responses uh, are not, I guess, the anonymous response I get on my course evaluation. I didn't think I'd like economics, but it really inspired me. Someone posted this podcast or this article on Packback, and now, you know, I'm thinking of taking nursing or there's crazy things like that. But uh, yeah, they see more value in the classroom, I think. It's not just there to get a grade. They can actually learn something new, find something interesting there, and just the atmosphere. I'm happier. I have more fun with the class, and same for my students. They're happier. They have more fun, and there's less anxiety, especially with the group exam and the think pair share activities in general. And just in general, when they answer my student response questions now, they realize, okay, if I get this wrong, if most people get this wrong, Gainer is going to give us another shot at it, and we can get uh, – we can work with our peers. So even that when they look at questions, they're less afraid to make mistakes because they realize if most of us make mistakes and he gives another chance to answer it, uh, and we can discuss it with our peers. So it's, it yeah, seems it's like there's less of like a punitive measure in your classroom. They're rewarded for taking the shot as opposed to being punished for taking yeah. a shot at something. Yeah, that's yeah, a great way to put it. So I think with formative evaluation, we really want to make it low stakes. We want to make our students comfortable in a way to make mistakes because we know when you make mistakes that's often when you learn when the breakthroughs happen so create an environment where they're okay it's fun to make mistakes or they're comfortable making mistakes getting a question wrong awesome and those were all the questions that that we had uh for today please everyone you know feel free you can shoot over any more questions and we can always recap later but we will be uh sending all of this over and feel free to y'all be added into the global faculty community that we have that exists purely for instructors to have these conversations at your leisure be able to really engage with the people who are living all of the same problems as you and uh, we'll be sending out this recording to everyone who registered as well so you can re-watch it reach out to us if you have any questions but alex thank you so much for your time and for sharing your research with us yeah thanks guys thanks for the opportunity to present this webinar thanks for hosting yeah. Of course, everyone have a wonderful day. Thank you so much for your time. Bye.